Um, today we're going to be talking about um, security and privacy, uh, centred around CV CCTV, but maybe touch on some wider issues. Um, so I'd just like to introduce uh, the panel today, which is uh, Nicole Stevenson uh, from Ground Up Consulting, uh, Danny Story from Psychic, and uh, Lani Rafferty from IoT Sec Australia. Welcome, guys. Um, well, I just uh, as that's a brief introduction, but just if if you're okay before we get into things, if you just say a bit more about um, you know what you do and uh, why you're here today, uh, Nicole, start with you, please. Well, hello everyone. I'm Nicole Stevenson, and I am a privacy consultant based in the Brisbane area. I have. 20 odd years of experience in the privacy field, which is really seen nowadays as um, a complementary or, or sister discipline to cybersecurity. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to add, um, I guess that additional level of depth to the discussion around security, because you really, we're at a point where when we're talking about the data of people, it's very hard to have one without the other, right? In terms of the discussion. Um, one thing that I think is really relevant for all of us today is that, that we take the time to unpack the issues as opposed to, um, you know, talking in sort of your, your sound grabby or, um, you know, little media level bites around uh, issues associated with security and privacy, because this is, this is a time certainly, um, you know, in our country and in terms of regulation and what's happening around the world where we need to actually have meaningful discussion and um, a level of debate on these issues, um, as opposed to, um, I guess, formulating our thoughts based on what we've heard um, in the media and through other sources. So thank you, Ross, so much for, for having me here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues as well. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Thanks for joining us. Danny, welcome. Thanks, Ross, and um, it's great to, to be uh, together today to have, to have this conversation. I think um, any time we're talking about security and or privacy, I think that's always a good thing. Um, I work with um, Psychic, as you mentioned, and I also work with Ion Cyber, um, particularly around uh, the technology side of things. And um, my background is in uh, technology architecture. And it's quite scary to me how security is often thought as an afterthought. And so I certainly think uh, that both security and privacy should be by design and as part of a holistic process, as opposed to um, something that we think about just before we go live or just after we, we've run into some problems. So I think um, having this conversation is a really important, but be really exciting because uh, the more we're talking about it and the more awareness is out there, hopefully the better we can be doing in those spaces. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Danny. And Lani, how are you? But, um, Thanks for having me on, uh, you know, and uh, Lani Rafiti. So I'm a, a cybersecurity uh, practitioner, have been for the last uh, 23 years, uh, which is a while. And so uh, I guess over the 23 years, I've got to see a lot of uh, trends, you know, sort of come and go and stick uh, and uh, have spent a lot of time in the tech, uh, tech space. So, you know, uh, with tech vendors like uh, Cisco and Intel uh, Corporation, and more recently, more on the management consulting side of things. So, uh, you know, Pricewaterhouse uh, Coopers, and more recently, I was a partner at, uh, at Deloitte, focusing in on cyber. And I guess the the, the area that I, I specialize, because cyber is quite a broad uh, domain or broad discipline, is uh, in the the IoT space, internet, uh, more probably the industrial internet of things, power, water, mining, uh, which is seeing a lot of that transformation. It's a bit cliche at the moment, but um, they're seeing a lot of that sort of uh, transformation as as legacy legacy sort of. Uh, equipment gets replaced and, and they're looking to do things a lot more uh, efficiently and, and more effectively uh, and adopting a lot of the IoT, um, you know, solutions, uh, both sensors and devices, but also uh, the data and what they do with it. Uh, and then obviously uh, data leading up to using that in the cloud as opposed to on-site. Uh, there's, there's very little these days uh, data analytics being done in data centers owned by companies. A lot of it is done either in GCP uh, Azure or, or AWS. So um, yeah, and, and and I think we spoke. Or, uh, we spoke. Or I spoke with Anson McKay. I think it's only three years ago talking yes. about the landscape around IoT. So uh, yeah, it's been an interesting last three years. A, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same. So yeah, and no, I'm looking forward to the uh, to the uh, discussion. Great, great. Well, thanks for joining us. That's probably a good point to kick off. I mean, like we did we did. I think it was yeah, nearly three years ago. We spoke. Um, we focused, I think, more on. Um, IoT in, in industrial, but how, how has the landscape changed in that time? 
Yeah, look, and a good place to start. And I think, as I said, a lot has changed. A lot has stayed the same. And I think back in the day, uh, we, we were really enamored with the, the number of sensors and the number of devices that were being deployed at the time. I think when we spoke, Gartner was forecasting something like 50 billion devices by 2020. And that was really what the focus was. And, and, and I think by most sources I looked at uh, recently, we're up probably around the 25 to 30 billion devices rolled out. But, um, you know, we, we've got the growing reach of 5G and the use of cloud, as I just mentioned, um, AWS and Azure, which I think will help the use cases and, and help us, you know, sort of scale those pilots to, to full-blown uh, applications. And, and, but what, happened, what has happened since, I guess, is the focus is more on the, on the qualitative aspect. Like, what are those use cases or applications and uh, how is that data being used, how it's being analysed, you know, using machine learning techniques, et cetera. And really, in the last three years, what, what has um, really become topical is data privacy. And uh, I'm sure Nicole will, will speak to it, but three years ago, when we were speaking IoT and, and security, it was very rare that you'd actually talk privacy. We, we talked a lot about secure by design, but no one was talking, you know, privacy by design. And I think that is what has changed a lot, where the focus has gone off merely just being the, the devices as such that's more uh, almost consumerized these days. Now it's the data. How are we analyzing the data? How is it being secured? And, and are there any privacy, uh, you know, implications? And what we're now seeing too is a lot of the, the pilots that were sort of uh, being tried out by different uh, sectors are moving more uh, you know, into mass deployments, sectors like manufacturing, uh, agriculture, and it's more out of necessity than anything. Uh, power and water are, are beginning to move uh, from that sort of pilot phase into full-blown rollouts, which I think will we'll help see that sort of mass adoption we've been expecting for a while. And then on the, on the flip side, there's been you know, a, lot of, a bit of movement around regulation. Uh, a few of the states in the US introducing sort of IoT security bills or, or laws and I think the US, UK government is, uh, is following suit as well. And then locally here in Australia, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll touch on is that we've uh, seen the federal government talk a lot about uh, cybersecurity in terms of the nation's defences. And uh, the 2020 cybersecurity strategy was just uh, released by the government as a refresh on the original one that was done in 2016. And while there's nothing specific about IoT in there, there is a lot around critical infrastructure. And critical infrastructure are and will be uh, great sort of use cases around IoT uh, in terms of expanding what critical infrastructure means uh, in terms of the law and also committing the government to directly helping customers, companies in the sector should they have uh, breaches, etc. So looking at today, I'll, I'll open this up to everyone. Where, where are things now? Before we go into, we'll probably dip into a couple of case studies, but where, where are we now in terms of risks and challenges and, um, you know, at a high level? So I'll, um, I just raised my hand, sorry, but I'm just so used to the Zoom etiquette. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's just, I think once you've been on a few panels, there's, there's nothing worse than interrupting each other. Um, mm -hmm. So sorry if I seem really, um, you know, school girl there, but um, <laughs> look, I think there's a couple of things happening, right? There's, there's public perception and then there's actually what's, what's happening in terms of um, our IOD to IoT deployments, particularly in say that surveillance space, um, which is really topical at the moment. Um, public perception is one of those things that really needs to be carefully managed. Um, and if you don't take your community along for the ride in terms of the, the deployments that you're taking on, on a large scale, whether it's um, in terms of surveillance or whether it's environmental sensing or whatever it is that you want to do with IoT, if the community is not along for the journey, they don't trust what's happening in the journey. And uh, this is something that I'll speak to later, certainly. But you know, in terms of my work with local governments, this is something that is, this is a critical, almost missing piece of the puzzle. And um, you know, that's that's about privacy, certainly, but it's also about just basic respect for the the community that you serve, and and particularly when uh, we're talking about governments deploying IoT. Um, which is largely the case, right? Our local governments, our state and federal governments for our smart cities or our critical infrastructure projects, governments um, really need to show a level of respect for the community um, in, in terms of what it is we wanna do with their data, why, for how long, those kinds of questions are really important. 
also in terms of public perception, I, I think there's a real risk of creating that 1984 Orwellian like society, at least from the perspective of the community where, um, you know, there's a lot of discourse, particularly um, among academics around the topic of um, uber-valence. And there's, um, there's a, a wonderful academic um, named Katina Michael, who I, I think is fantastic. And uh, she and, um, and her colleagues research this idea that, that we're moving to a state where there's surveillance from above, right? Satellites, et cetera. There's surveillance from around us, so our CCTV cameras. There's surveillance on us, right? Our, our smartwatches uh, or RFID tags on things that we might carry around. And then there's also surveillance in us, say in our pacemaking devices uh, or perhaps some other kind of an implant. And that from the perspective of the community is quite scary. So that's, that's kind of, that's your community perception and you know, fear-based experience relating to IoT. The flip side, and certainly where I like to come in, is seeing, seeing those perceptions and those fears as a real opportunity for our governments, for our industry, uh, even our vendor community, to get things right from the outset, to be aware of those perceptions or those fears, and concentrate on building those out of the equation uh, in terms of product design as well as the way that those products are deployed. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like from a um, government standpoint, anyway, you said yourself a piece missing from a, from a policy perspective. And I think we'll, we'll probably dig into that in more detail. But Danny, from a, from a te technology standpoint, you work in, in this area um, as an architect. I mean, how do you see it from, from a technical perspective in terms of security and privacy? Uh, is there, is it, well, perhaps we'll use a case study to go into that in more detail, but a high level is there, um, is there a similar lack of, uh, a lack of um, policy, if that's the right word, or governance? Yeah, look, I think um, something that before, before I dive too deep into that, I think what Nicole said around, you know, taking the community on that journey and involving them in the process, it's not always that there's actually a problem, um, but there can be a perception of a problem. So there's, you know, I won't, I won't name any specifics here, but there's plenty of examples where a council's gone out and put CCTV cameras up and there is a public perception of what they're collecting, what they're doing with that information that may or may not be true. But the fact that the community weren't taken on that journey, you know, they, they almost leap to the worst case scenario and that sort of Orwellian, well, what are you doing with our data kind of concern? And I sort of see that as, as being a, a really common um, interpretation by the community that is not engaged. Um, so I'll say that first. You know, that doesn't mean that that is what's happening. That doesn't mean that that's not what's happening. But the fact that they weren't consulted is often one of the biggest challenges. So I would say that in both at the privacy and security side of things, there may or may not actually be issues, but the fact that people haven't pro provided that information or people haven't been consulted on that information often causes more issues than the problems themselves. Um, and I guess that's just the human factor, right? And it's not knowing what's going on and, and having concerns which are quite adequate when it's our personal information. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll say that and sort of put that to the side and privacy by no means is my area of expertise, but it's certainly an observation, particularly in the smart city space. Um, what I would say around the technology choices and how people govern and go about that, look, that there's room for improvement. <laughs> you know, let's say that. It doesn't always mean it's terrible, but there is a lot of um, organizations, including government, that are going out and making decisions that aren't necessarily well-informed and there's great examples too. Um, I guess I'm sort of focusing on those where it's not so fantastic. Um, and I think having policy and frameworks and governance and guidelines should be one of the first steps, not buying shiny toys and starting to put them out in the you know, public space and then finding a bunch of problems and trying to deal with the consequences. So I would just say around the process that they go about things, you know, the governance should be upfront, not an afterthought, and I guess that's where the privacy and security by design comes in. Um, yeah. So a, a great example, go on, go on, Lenny. No, after you, Danny. I was going to say the great example of that is there is a council, and then actually there's probably more than one that's done this, is they've gone and put environmental sensors out with completely benign kind of purpose. They just want to understand local air quality, what's going on, um, but some of them included light sensors. 
And an unintended consequence of that is that you could kind of tell when people were home and when they weren't based on the environmental changes. And because that data was publicly available, that's obviously caused some concern and potentially you could know when to go and burgle someone's house. Now, it's a really extreme example, I suppose, but it's kind of an example where there was no you know, malicious intent, there was no surveillance intent, but that's what happened, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, and I guess um, the reason I say the governance is so important is that there is unintended consequences when we do things we haven't done before. So I would just say that, you know, I think that extra level of care up front can help anticipate and um, alleviate those concerns rather than doing that retrospectively. That's, that, that's, that's really great, actually, uh, and, and good points, especially around that un unintended consequences. I find, particularly in the smart cities um, use case, that would probably be the, the, the most of what I come across in terms of that unintended uh, consequences. And th there, is a, uh, there is an art form, too, in terms of you know, bringing the community along. Uh, I remember back in 2014, where we, when we were implementing or designing the smart city strategy for the uh, local Queensland councils, you know, as with any sort of good management consultants, we sort of went in and with the, the co-design aspect of, uh, you know, designing it with citizens in mind. Uh, we held, uh, I think it was like five sort of public workshops. Like, and I gotta say, we probably got maybe at most five people along to those workshops. Um, so at that stage in 2014, uh, it was very, very difficult to get people to buy into it because it was like, well, it's, it's a technology project council's doing, what, what do I care? Um, whereas over the, t you know, over time, we've sort of honed our, uh, our approach to that. And in, in the last project I worked on, uh, which involved a, um, it wasn't a, a local government, it was more of a uh, sort of a, um, a property uh, builder, I guess, you know, in terms of like a, a land lease or a Stockland building a, um, you know, a, uh, an estate in, in the south of Brisbane and, and trying to get, you know, the community engaged. It was, um, it was really heartening to see that we would sort of improved our approach you know, and, and what we did was um, we, we basically, instead of just making it about the people in terms of what's in it for me, uh, a lot of the work that we did was what's in it for you and your friends and your family who live around you, you know, so, so went with that sort of community feel. And we were getting, you know, 50 to 100 people per, you know, over the four workshops that we, uh, that we ran. And, you know, we mixed that up with social media uh, as well. So we had a lot more engagement. And so there, there, there is an art form when you, when you want to bring the community on for a ride. And, um, and you don't, you know, there's, it was um, the councils in the Northern Territory, actually, I, I won't name them, but it's public record, you know, it was in the public in terms of CCTV cameras that were being deployed. And again, it was, um, you know, if you looked at what uh, was being deployed and what the council was saying, the, the technology that we're using were, was benign, but um, it just so happened that it was the same vendor that was being used by some of the Chinese cities in terms of their surveillance, etc. So it sort of whipped up a, a, you know, sort of mini hysteria, the media got onto it, et cetera. So that's probably a good use case to, to show you what happens when you don't do that uh, well in terms of that community engagement and sort of the laying of fears of the community uh, around things like surveillance. Yeah, I, I might just, just add to that, Lani, like uh, in all of the engagements I think we've had with local government, I think that sort of benign um, intent it, you know, I haven't come across a, a government department yet who's trying to use that for a purpose other than what people are generally quite happy with. And usually it, it's driven by public safety or um, anonymized data to help them better plan cities, um, being two typical examples. Um, you know, getting on the front foot with that would have made so much of a difference um, in examples like the one you pointed out. Um, mm. And it, it often is the case, and I, as I said, I'm yet to come across one yet where it's not the case. Um, it's mostly been a communications issue and a collaboration issue as opposed to a, uh, you know, a technology or a privacy um, issue as such. And I suppose mm -hmm. when we get into that, we're really talking obviously facial recognition and data matching and all sorts of things that people don't want to see. Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, whether the governance and frameworks behind the scenes is in place to stop that from occurring, I guess, is where either people don't have the trust or they don't have the information and therefore they sort of fill in the blanks. They're the two scenarios, you know, we, we see really often. I think there's kind of a, a bit of a cowboy thing that goes on as well. Um, when you talked about shiny toys, I just thought, yes, that's exactly right. It's, it's almost like in, in some ways, our, um, particularly our local government, they're a little bit like magpies, right? And they, they just hone in on the, the shiny thing and they want to bring it back to their nest. And I, I, I think that's wonderful in so many ways. 
but I wonder about the rigor around that. Um, you know, even if you look at the, the, the huge round of smart cities funding that has enabled, um, you know, our cities all over Australia to gain access to the same kinds of technologies, right? So, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, one of the Northern Territory cities that got access to CCTV cameras that had facial recognition capability and that hit the media and there was a big storm about that. Well, do you know all the other cities that received exactly that same funding got exactly those same cameras? And it makes me think, well, where was the link between privacy, security, and the funding? Who, who said, nobody, obviously, that look, these cities need to do their privacy and their cyber homework before they can get access to this funding, that they need to demonstrate some level of uh, capability around communicating properly to the community, around having um, strong privacy management in place, around having data breach management in place. You know, all of, all of those things that, that say to me, a city's mature enough to deploy technologies of that type. And that didn't happen with that, that recent round of funding. Uh, as a result, what we had was just magpies swooping on the technology, not thinking about what was going to happen when they brought it back to their nest. Uh, and, and some cities were very lucky. They haven't had any uh, community outcry at all. Um, but that's possibly because the community just in those cases uh, isn't alive, aren't alive to the, to the mm -hmm. issues that, that are really relevant for them right now. Can I ask, are there any state or, or federal guidelines around implementing security and the standards that need to be adhered, either, either relating to areas like facial recognition or just, just basic security measures? Well, there's certainly, there's certainly laws in place. Um, so you have your federal and state territory privacy laws. There's a couple of states that don't have privacy laws, which is a tiny bit worrying. So Western Australia and South Australia both work on the basis of administrative standards. Um, and actually cities in those, um, in those states have <laughs> um, probably a higher proportion of IoT testing going on right? Because there just isn't, there isn't that uh, legislative rigor uh, in place in terms of what, um, you know, what the compliance obligations of the cities are. And then there's also your, um, your surveillance legislation. So a number of states also have rules around um, uh, human surveillance that have to be taken uh, into account before um, they use particular technologies in particular ways. So look, I think, I think what's happening though is that people are deploying the technologies and then they're worrying about the rules later. Uh, and I, I see this certainly as a, you know, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in the regulatory space. So working for privacy commissioners where you're observing cities putting in technologies such as this and trying to provide uh, guidance around how to apply the legislation in that case. And usually it's a cart before the horse arrangement right, where the, yeah. the technology is deployed before they do the homework about how to get there safely uh, in terms of community privacy or, or even that, that security rigor. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have gone into a city to find that they don't even have a basic information security policy, let alone a digital security policy, and they're deploying technologies of this type. So where does the buck stop then for, for cities like that? Is, it, is, is there any accountability when it comes down to it? Uh, you'd like to think so, right? Um, I mean, we, we do have privacy commissioners. We have um, other review bodies. Um, even ombudsmen um, can get involved in decisions that the cities might take to deploy technologies if those decisions, you know, could, be, could amount to maladministration. There's lots of different ways mm -hmm. you can kind of catch cities in that regulatory net. That doesn't tend to happen though. Um, and maybe that's not the appropriate vehicle as well. You, you know, sometimes the, the more appropriate vehicle is holding cities to account through the court of public opinion, um, mm. such as in, in the case of um, the Northern city that we were mentioning, the community was really upset. They felt that they had, um, they'd been bamboozled, right? They, they just felt like their trust had been eroded, even though their privacy technically hadn't been. And the amount of work that that particular local government had to go to to reverse 
that opinion of them was really extensive. Um, and they've done it. I, I feel that they've, they've really done a good job of turning things around, but you wouldn't want to be a city in that position, I would think. And I'd say it probably, um, it probably still lives on in the Facebook forums as well, all these things. And I mean, China has been mentioned, but we can't really talk about um, CCTV without uh, Chinese um, potential surveillance. I'm putting everything in, put everything in quote marks or even uh, Russian hackers. I mean, it, it's big news. It's, um, it's really pushing people's fears, but it does seem like it's uh, a measured and, and real threat in some ways. And that directly you know, comes back to people's privacy. Yeah, and, and, and it is like, you know, the, the government recently, uh, I think it was June, mid-June, came out on a Friday uh, and made this big public announcement that, uh, you know, nation state attackers had been active in Australia over the last few months uh, and had gotten to the stage where they had to come out and make a public sort of announcement, which was kind of alarming. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I stick close to the, you know, threat intel, et cetera, that, that's made either public or, or via private feeds. And yes, there, there was an uptick in, in a lot of the uh, groups that are, you know, sort of, uh, that are allied with the, um, uh, you know, the Chinese government, but it was a, it was a big announcement. And, and I think that's really put cyber in the context of nation state uh, attackers, primarily China. I mean, that, that's the elephant in the room, right? We, we don't like to talk about it, but that's who the government and who the prime minister was uh, referring to when he spoke about nation state attackers in Southeast Asia. It was our biggest trading partner, uh, uh, China. So you're right. If, if you look at that and that sort of heightened funding now that's been sort of diverted to the Australian Signals Directorate to, to beef up our critical infrastructure, to beef up our uh, sort of national defences, in the context of what we've just been talking about in terms of uh, cities, local governments deploying smart cities type tech, it, it, it is becoming a... Uh, you know, a bigger sort of thing that we've got to be concerned about. I, I wouldn't say overly worried, but, but there's, there's some cause for concern. I mean, you listen to what Nicole said, which I fully concur with in terms of cities, if we're talking about that context, will deploy technology ahead of what either their capability is or what regulations or what, uh, you know, that they have to follow. It, it just simply is, uh, that is the case, right? So if you put it, you know, nation states into that context, yeah, it is an area for concern both now and in the near uh, future. Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I guess to build on that, uh, Lani, I, I guess the other side of it is that obviously there's a number of areas where the government's outright banned certain types of technology because of those um, concerns. Um, and as Nicole mentioned around, um, you know, the surveillance sort of uh, legislation and how, um, you know, there's examples of, uh, particularly with actually with, um, uh, microphones and and, and uh, listening to uh, public activity. Um, there's some states and territories that have dealt with that really well, and there's plenty of examples where they have gone and done things that they weren't aware of. And I guess um, one thing I would note is that you know you can't expect every government uh, entity, including you know the local governments that don't have the same resources as some of the others. Um, they may or may not have that expertise in house, but they do have a duty of care and responsibility. And I guess it's difficult for them to even be a aware of some of these things and b find the right guidance and advice, because quite often it's, you know, someone doing their very best, um, you know, from the IT department or, you know, innovation department or what have you applying the common sense of what they know um, and just not having all that tools and information that they really need. I, I very rarely see anyone that I think is, you know, deliberately ignoring responsibility, but certainly there is sometimes the wrong people in those roles, not aware of some of those responsibilities. I, I imagine you'd, you probably would have similar comment. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that I really encourage our cities to do in particular, never mind other organizations, um, is to conduct privacy impact assessments. Mm -hmm. And you know, a, a, a component of that involves information security, right? That the, the city needs to outline what are the physical and technical and administrative steps that they're taking to secure personal information in particular, right? In the case of um, privacy impact assessments. But more broadly, that's a really important exercise. The idea that you know, whether you're a large local government or small, whether you're a large organization or small, whether you're a startup, it doesn't actually matter. You need to do that diligence and mm -hmm. go through that, that approach. And, um, you know, all of us 
here would have capability to provide that kind of guidance to a city um, and to help them build that internally so that they have that kind of sustainable capacity over time. You know, um, I like the idea that for any project that involves deploying technology, that a city would have privacy and security representation at the table and that no technology project should be going ahead without having those representatives have a look at it. Um, and if the city doesn't have the capacity in-house or whatever the organization is, if they don't have the capacity in-house, they need to bring it in and consider that part of their project budgeting. I've got a question for you, Nicole. I mean, um, in terms of the privacy law, right? Am I right in assuming that our national privacy law councils and that are exempt, but they are, they do fall under the state uh, laws? Yeah, so, so they, they have to comply with whatever the privacy rules are in the state or territory that they, they live in, um, yeah. which, is, which is great. The state and territory privacy laws are substantially similar to what you see uh, in our Federal Privacy Act, with the exception of some things like data breach notification isn't something that you see in every state and territory law. And then, of course, we have those, those couple of rogue states that haven't got around to it yet. Um, and Queensland actually didn't, didn't get its privacy law until 2009, uh, which is quite a long time if you consider that the federal law has been in place since 1988. Oh, yes. right? so there's, this, there's this really kind of long time lag um, in terms of regulation, but there's still plenty of information and global discourse around privacy and security, and it still risks that that our um, that our cities, our decision makers, should be alive to even even if they're not um, required to observe a particular law. There are uh, there are international rules and standards in relation to both privacy and security that they can they can apply kind of in a worst case scenario if there isn't legislation uh, that applies to them directly. Mm. And, and, and in terms of, I'm, I'm working with the council at the moment, one of the questions, and this is a common question I get, is that when it comes to like a privacy impact assessment, my, my guideline usually for them is it's not like a one shot, you do it once and that's it, right? It, it's almost like an iterative, continuous improvement type um, process. But for a, for a council that's already, uh, you know, limited in terms of the skills in that space, what, what's the best way to approach it in terms of having a setting that baseline when you do your initial assessment, uh, but then making it, you know, uh, continuously uh, being able to improve it? Well, look, there's, there's a couple of things that they can do for sure. Uh, one thing that, that I work to embed in the councils that I work with is um, what you call a privacy threshold assessment process, right. where you have a look at a really high level um, at your project and you make doing that assessment part of the project management gateway, right? So you cannot proceed with project management until you until you go through that threshold assessment Just like you can't if you don't do your workplace health and safety assessment And if you don't do your equal opportunity assessment and all the various other things that are well embedded in decision making for projects and If a project involves personal information, you know collecting it and handling it in some way that then triggers a privacy impact assessment. Um, but it's through the threshold assessment process that you decide how deep you need to go, right? Some, some projects are going to be much lower risk than others. Um, and the threshold assessment process helps you work that out. It isn't something though that, you know, a project officer in a council can do without a level of training or assistance. So if there's not a privacy officer uh, or a privacy team in that council, and some councils don't have that person, um, there needs to be someone that they can go to, whether it's a, you know, a legal officer or an outside expert, or honestly, even just the guidelines that are published on uh, privacy commissioner websites in each state and territory. Uh, there, there does need to be a point of reference for those people if they're going to do that activity uh, properly. I'm muted. Just on that point, I mean, um, who who owns who owns the data, uh, um, and are, are there guidelines as to how that data is treated? I mean, I know, I know we touched on some point, but you've specifically got a service provider providing an infrastructure or systems to create the data, and the data's there. 
Um, there's risk around how that data is treated, but who owns it and who's ultimately respons responsible for it? Are we asking me? Is it the per about the personal stuff? Oh, I think you're you're on mute there, Ross. Sorry, I was just I was kind of I was kind of opening up. It was kind of to a follow on from you, Nicole, but it's probably something that everyone will have some some understanding of. Well, I can start. I'll talk about the personal stuff. So the the way that the um, I guess the accountability chain works when it comes to privacy is that the the say if we're talking about a local government or an organization or a small business or whomever is owning the project whoever's deciding to do the thing, whoever is collecting the personal information in order to do the thing, they're the agency, the organization that's responsible for uh, privacy and security. And it's through their contracts with the different vendors, the different organizations that they then also require those, those other players to observe the same kind of privacy and security rigor. Um, ultimately though, say in local governments, um, if, if something falls down, if something goes wrong, if my privacy is breached, it's my local government that's held to account first. And then they may hold their, their vendors or sub, you know, particular subcontractors to account uh, if necessary. Mm. And, I mean, and, and in practice, it's really difficult to, to, to get to, I, I found. Uh, I worked on a project um, back in 2018 where an online retailer here in Australia, quite a large one, had been approached by Facebook in terms of, uh, you know, get, getting into an agreement where they could um, collaborate on data projects. Uh, you know, if this online retailer and they had a lot of different brands that they they had, if they if they would allow Facebook access to the you know to the data, Facebook would enrich it with their their data, etc., and they could start building new data products and services off the back of it, improve the um, you know the service to their client give the, uh, the retailer much, much more rich information in terms of buying patterns, uh, advertising, et cetera. So on paper, it looked like a fantastic deal. The board were all for it because it was going to, you know, be a good news story and, and open up new revenue streams for it. So we were brought in not to look at the privacy aspect because they had, they had a, a chief privacy officer, but to look at more the, the you know, the contractual constructs and around how the data was secured, where it was kept, you know, data jurisdictions, et cetera. And the, the whole project fell over in the end because they just could not, they hammered it out for about nearly six months in terms of contractual arrangement, data jurisdiction, in terms of where the data was kept, uh, you know, the chain of custody, as, as Nicole would um, you know, mention. And it got so difficult that both parties said, hey, look, you know, maybe right now, the just the time is not right in terms of where, you know, privacy laws are in different countries uh, and where data centers were located, et cetera. So it, it, it's not an easy thing to do especially if you're talking to like an overseas um, uh, player as well. Oh yeah, even, even right now, if you think um, of all of the issues that are coming out of Europe, um, out of a, a recent decision there, um, the, the Court of Justice in the, the EU um, decided on a matter that, um, they call it Schrems too. So this, this fellow called Max Schrems made a complaint about Facebook to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. And, and through you know, a whole bunch of wheeling and dealing, the complaint ended up back with the European courts. And it was decided that it's not lawful to transfer personal data of EU citizens to, and store it in the United States. And the reason it's not lawful is because the United States um, can't demonstrate that they have uh, a robust privacy regime there on which people can rely in the event that they need to make a complaint. And that it's a it's a surveillance um, it's a surveillance state. You know, it's sort of, it's one of those things, right? We don't often think of the United States as a you know a place where surveillance is rife, but in terms of government surveillance of the people through uh, their national security legislation and now the the Cloud Act, um, you know, those are pretty significant things. And we are seeing issues like this pop up all over the world in terms of our relationships with our vendors and there is a real need during that procurement process to bed down who exactly those vendors are where they're located where they store their data who their subcontractors are and who their you know where their subcontractors store data right so you might have a whiz bang vendor that says yep yeah, we're going to store everything you know maybe in new zealand or here in australia but then they use subcontractors that do bits with that data and those guys are based in Uzbekistan, right? If you haven't done your due diligence, 
you know, the data might walk out the door. I think, I think this is a challenge. Um, you know, it was one of the things we're nailing with, with, um, with the councils, but uh, with um, Danny and Lani who are implementing um, te technology solutions for, um, for councils and, uh, and smarter cities, the ch it, it wouldn't be too much to say that those people should be asking the vendors, okay, what are you guys doing? So there, there should be an onus as much on the vendor as the, uh, uh, as the local authority to say, this is, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to protect you. But then I suppose it's, the question's got to be asked in the first place. I mean, how do you guys find people's knowledge around that um, when you're going into this type of implementation project? Um, I'm happy to start, Lani, because I'm sure you've got dozens of examples of this. Um, I, I guess the two common things well, I see at least, are one, um, it's not always really clear who owns the data. Um, so there's plenty of occasions where people are paying for software that's ultimately owned by the software vendor. So yes, they use it, they, yes, they have a copy of it, but the data can be taken off and, and sort of used for other purposes. I think that's one of the more dangerous um, areas because then they have no control over what happens at all. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, a master's thesis that I did on privacy and things like flybys and everyday rewards, but that's a totally different kettle of fish. Um, but things like saying we own your data and we or any of our third parties can use it essentially translates to me as you've got no control of what's happening um, and you've just authorized that. So I think there's two parts. I think one is um, the frameworks around consuming and using products. And of course, plenty of vendors have um, data centers all over the world and we need to be really clear about where they're going where even the backups go so not just so much the actual data where I use it yes it's hosted in Australia yes it's um, you know it's in Sydney and I know exactly where it is um, but then the, the copies of that you know quite quickly uh, as Nicole sort of put it walks you know walks out the door and it um, you know it can end up in places that you hadn't anticipated so I would say definitely that there has to be a level of responsibility um, I wouldn't leave that just to asking vendors for the answers to your questions because um, quite often they'll give you an answer, but it's half of the answer. Um, and it's only when you ask very pointy specific questions about you know, data ownership, data locations, data backups, replication, those sorts of things that you really get to the truth. Um, mm. And I don't think there's a huge amount of transparency there. So I think there's quite a number of dangers and I don't think most organizations are well equipped to know what to ask. Um, so I think that, you know, um, I mean, the three of us obviously see this quite often, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that I don't think is particularly well known. And in the procurements that I have seen from government, they ask some of the right questions, but they probably don't ask enough of those right questions. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I regularly have some concerns around that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with what, uh, what Danny said. And, and I'd probably highlight too the, where, uh, and, and this is not just councils, but where organizations that I've worked with struggle is, is when they look at uh, the risk uh, in their supply chain. So if you think about the privacy issues, the cyber issues we've been talking about, you know, imagine if your vendor then, you know, subcontracted part of that to, a, you know, a third party who subcontracted that to another party, et cetera. And that risk uh, in terms of that chain becomes much more complex as you try and sort of quantify the risk and, and apply sort of controls to mitigate that. And the, the example I've, you know, the most recent example I had is, is working with a property development. Um, they were more of a property, not a, uh, a construction, but more of a management, property management. Uh, and they had a lot of their, um, uh, you know, sort of um, control centers in that that sort of uh, monitored a lot of the CCTV, monitored data uh, devices in that from the shopping centers that they operate, you know, operated. A lot of that was third party to, you know, uh, organizations that were offshore, Philippines, India. And so when we did a, an assessment of their, you know, uh, you know, so we had people actually overseas and visit the actual offices, you know, the, the privacy practices in those, uh, you know, third parties were extremely poor, right? Where they would have uh, desk, you know, sort of sharing, and then people would be leaving documents in that from their previous, uh, you know, client that they were working with on their desks. So the, the that sort of supply chain risk is really, really difficult to uh, to you know, sort of secure and to get a view of. And and the other thing I guess I, I talk about when you talk about ownership of data is there is, you know, we, we're moving into the era of now data exchange and data monetization. So, you know, there's a number of platforms in the market where, you know, you pay to 
uh, upload or, or sort of uh, distribute the data that you have from sensors that you have deployed around the place. And then you track it in terms of, you know, you build a new data product, you know, uh, using something like a app store sort of, um, uh, you know, concept and you build a new product and whoever the data you've taken and sort of used gets, you know, clipped along the way. So that in terms of who owns the data, who's responsible for it, becomes a little bit murkier unless the, the, the vendor who's sort of hosting that um, service has really good controls and good contractual controls around, uh, around who owns the data and what you can do with it. I think um, there's also an issue of understanding that your vendors often are just looking out for, you know, their own selves. So I have, I have a client actually that I'm working with now that's, that's looking into, um, you know, beefing up their, their security, which I'm really, I'm really happy about. Um, but this didn't really come up for them and, until I raised, well, you know, how, how are you um, assessing for vulnerabilities? Um, you know, so they, they have, um, there's a, an infrastructure as a service uh, product that they're, or offering that they're taking advantage of my client. And, and they said, well, you know, the, the vendor does this sort of automated testing. And, and I said, oh yeah, well, where does the, t where does the testing originate? Who does it? Oh, a subcontractor in India. And I said, oh, okay, well, is it, is it, you know, it, does somebody sit there and push a button or is it just a program that kind of runs behind the scenes? Uh, well, it's just a program that runs behind the scenes that does this automated vulnerability testing. And, and I asked, well, what are they testing for? Well, they're testing for known vulnerabilities in their own product. So they're not actually testing for full, you know, the full suite of vulnerabilities and, and having a look to see where actual risks are and where you know, all the holes need to be plugged. They're just looking to plug the holes in their own product, right? To cover, you know, their own backside. That's not, that is not enough um, from a security perspective, never mind a privacy perspective, if the data that's in question is personal. So these are the kinds of things that, that I come up against. And it doesn't matter what the technology is, right? Whether it's, um, you, know, you know, or even what it is you're storing right? What kind of data it is. It can be entirely financial data. It can be uh, data that appears to be uh, non-personal, but in fact is, you know, highly identifying something like location data, for example. Um, you know, that combine, combined with one other piece of data could, you know, identify a person as they move through their life very easily. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I look at, and it's, this is exactly where privacy and security I think have a really beautiful intersection. And I think you can't uh, talk about one without the other. You know, the, in terms of security, you can definitely, um, you can have security without having privacy, I would say, but you can't have privacy at all without that security component being covered off. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm dealing with clients or I'm providing information sessions, I always try to make that causal link and that, that example of, you know, a vendor doing their own vulnerability assessments for their own stuff, um, they're not actually taking care of you in the context of the contract. They're taking care of themselves. Mm. Mm. And that's common, right? I mean, even, even if you look at cloud service providers like uh, Microsoft, uh, AWS, Google, if you, if you look at their uh, contract clauses, all their security is for the platform. But you yourself as a client still need to maintain you know, security for your data that's hosted, your instances that are hosted in those services. Mm. I suppose I, that, sorry. Sorry, Ross, I, was, I was just gonna add, I, I guess even with all the right um, frameworks and things in place, the other thing that often gets forgotten is who has access to that data. So not so much who owns it, not so much how vulnerable is it, but like who actually has access? Uh, yeah. And that's something that very rarely gets asked. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something we design for very well, I don't think, Danny. I, I think that's, you know, one of the, that's usually the question that gets asked after the horse has bolted and, you know, there has been some kind of a data breach or um, an interference with privacy. That's when the question is, well, who had access to this? And, you know, how could you let that happen? Yeah, yeah. And, and it goes back to that supply chain, you know, third party risk, right? Because, and I'll use the, the what I, the use case I talked about previously, the, the the company was a, a BPO organization that was based in India. And so one uh, analyst that you would have working would be working multiple clients right through four clients. 
And in terms of how that data was handled, it was just complete mismatch, you know, in terms of where it was stored, uh, you know, hard physical data that was left on the desks, uh, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. And it's something that, as you said, it's something I, I find doesn't come up until the auditors start coming in and having a look and then, uh, yeah, and uncover that. Yeah. Well, about that time where we're all scratching our heads wondering how something happened and <laughs> yeah. start asking questions that probably should have been asked some time ago. You know how we talked earlier, really earlier, um, and Danny, you mentioned about privacy by design and security by design and how important those two things are. For me, I think some of these issues can be worked out if we actually just have the conversations ahead of time. Yep. You know, before we have finished building the thing or before we buy the tech or before we deploy the tech, have the conversations uh, to design for the outcomes that we want. So if, you know, if we are concerned about, uh, you know, citizen privacy or we are concerned about instances of data breach, you know, relating to unauthorized access, what, whatever it is we're concerned about, you know, getting that, getting that down up front and working, you know, working to remove that as a risk before we actually go through the deployment exercise. Uh, I think that that's just so much better, but it's more time consuming. It's, uh, it does actually force us to think about the decisions we're making and why. And that's not really a comfortable place for leadership necessarily, right? They, they often want they want the shiny tech to be deployed. They want to be first. I see this, I see this in the case of cities all the time. The competitiveness is insane. Yeah. Um, but the good decision-making lags behind sometimes when it, when it comes to how we deploy those technologies. Also, I think it goes um, to uh, perception. I think Danny, sorry, I can't remember Danny or Nicole mentioned. Because people perceive financial data is essential. You know, to be, it has to be bulletproof, looked after. People perceive... Um, vulnerability assessments for websites. I mean, we've seen security breaches there. Again, it needs to be bulletproof, but there seems to be a lack for, from what you guys have said of the perception of importance in privacy data. I mean, we've seen, I've, I've seen um, anecdotal um, reports around people being able to break into certain IoT technologies and get wider, but the, the discussion's always there about the wider security breach, that they could get a backdoor into a system and, and create havoc. But no one's there seems to be less importance of personal data and what's been done with it. But maybe that's because, well, I, I don't know, I don't know the reasons why, but as we look at more, um, it seems to be more almost about inconvenience. You know, people don't necessarily want to be watched going down the streets or their habits, but when we come to rec um, facial recognition and the kind of Orwellian uh, Kind of tunnel that you can go down around these things then then maybe that importance will be um will be raised just briefly because i know nicole you've probably got the the most uh, i guess to contribute here but i think it's broadly accepted that financial data health data that's really important um, and sometimes even like people's names and addresses that's kind of quite generally understood um, where I think it gets grey is that people don't understand some of the newer technology and what data is actually being collected in the first place to properly understand and assess that risk. Um, but the other, the other point um, I guess I wanted to point out is that we treat security, I mean, cybersecurity and we treat privacy like they're not like any other organisational risk. Like it's not like mm -hmm. organisations leave the front door unlocked, like especially around physical security, people generally do a pretty good job of that but it's almost like it's just kind of out of sight, out of mind when it comes to both cyber and privacy. And I do wonder if it's because they can't physically see it. <laughs> so I, I don't know, uh, Lani and Nicole, if you've got uh, things to add there, but that's just my observation of it. Yeah, I, I would agree, Danny. And it's, it's a, a, a fight that we've been fighting in the cyber space for a long, long time. Uh, and um, I, I think we are, we're just sort of making real sort of uh, impact and especially like if you look at the um, at the cyber strategy the Australian government just released, where they're looking to make board directors accountable now, uh, you know, in the in law, right? So, and I, I think that will will help a lot. But you are right; it's uh, it's because it's hard to quantify, uh, put it that way. And I find that organisations with strong OHS practices, you know, mining anything to do with sort of physical safety, usually have a have a better sort of grasp on the cyber risk uh, as well. It's probably because they have a grasp on the outcome. Mm 
mm. right? In, in that OHS yeah. context, the mm-hmm. outcome c- could be death. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but not yeah. recognizing that that if there is a cyber breach, um, you know, say of an air conditioning system in a, in a hospital, or you know, if the if the uh, you know the oxygen flow is turned off mm. by some baddie. There's going to be death there as well. We, but we don't, we don't think about that as the natural consequence of, um, you know, cyber attack. We mm-hmm. often, th- we often think more the financial consequence, right? You'd see your denial of service attacks or whatever. You, 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 you think of well, how's that going to disrupt my business? And, I'm, and am I going to have to pay somebody to, you know, have this problem undone? Now, so, but I. Th- I really like the way that this conversation is going because the the idea of uh, accountability, the idea of responsibility, I don't actually feel that that sits with the community, right? I don't think it's the community's job to understand, you know, really what the cyber risks are associated with dealing with an organization, or that they should be accountable for their own crimes. And I, I just, I think that the idea that in the, the cybersecurity strategy, you know, well, I have views on it. I think that the, I, the idea that there's that, that additional accountability, that requirement for additional training and awareness, and those things are really super important in terms of building an organization's capacity to deal with cyber and then by extension, privacy issues. So um, we, we've covered off a couple of topics. I don't, I don't want to um, bring things to a close. I'm sure that there's a lot more to talk about too quickly, but um, I, I think that there's probably some areas to pick up going forward. But wh- where we're at now, I mean, how do we see this maturing? Is, is, there, a, is there an easy fix for everything? Because there's lots of there's different maturities within, um, uh, within councils, within um, within private bodies as well. I mean, do we need an ASIC type uh, regulatory body on top of that? Is it realistic? Um, what, what are your views just quickly to, um, to kind of close, close this off? I think, I think the different sectors are, are acting. Like if you look at the power sector, they've recently, AMO, who's the regulator in that, have brought in uh, a framework, a cyber framework called uh, AES CSF. So, you know, um, uh, the financial services uh, regulator uh, APRA already has one. So I think you find that the different sectors, the, the water sector is looking to to build one at the moment. So I find you, I think you'll find the different sectors will get into that. And then, uh, you know, from a government perspective, the government definitely is moving in that direction uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the latest strategy. Uh, the, the two things that stood out for me is within critical infrastructure, the government will actually intervene if there is a breach in terms of, uh, you know, critical infrastructure operators will need to report up to to the government, you should probably buy the ACSC, and then they will be able to intervene to uh, to help out. And the second one is boards becoming actually accountable legally for um, for cybersecurity. So I think we're heading from a regulatory perspective, we, we are heading in the right direction. Um, you know, but given the fact that regulations normally move a lot slower than innovation, right, and, and technology in general. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Um, I think we need to wrap up now. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. Nicole, Danny and Lani. Thanks to the viewers as well for, for watching us.